Dr. Stephen Gundry, we all change our mind on things or evolve our thinking. What are some things that you've changed your mind on in the last five, seven years? Well, there, I talk about this in one of the chapters in Gut Check, uh, and I actually call it the Plant Paradox 2.0. And it's kind of what I learned uh, in the seven odd years since I wrote The Plant Paradox, which was a big game changer for a lot of people. So one of the things uh, I learned since that time is we've been able to systematically do leaky gut testing on people. And by leaky gut, we can measure intestinal permeability. And it's not pseudoscience, it's measurable. And with a blood test, that's number one. So I didn't have those tests when I wrote The Plant Paradox. I was convinced from the research that leaky gut was real. Now, if you'd asked me 20 years ago, uh, did I think leaky gut was real? I probably would have called it pseudoscience back then. And I think a lot of people, particularly in mainstream medicine, think leaky gut is pseudoscience, and it's not. It's uh, strong, hard evidence that we can measure. So that's number one. Uh, so it's not pseudoscience. Um, number two, the causes of leaky gut were actually pretty much right on of what I predicted they would be. Let me give you an example. Um, every patient with autoimmune disease that I see, and I my practice is now about 80% autoimmune patients who aren't getting any better or want to get off their biologic medications um, for multiple really good reasons. Uh, 100% of those people, number one, have leaky gut. Number two, 100% of those people have IgG antibodies to wheat germ agglutinin, which is in whole wheat, all the various components of gluten and non-gluten wheat proteins, which is about 25% of the proteins in wheat. These are also in rye and barley and mostly in oats. So 100% of people with an autoimmune disease have antibodies to the various forms of wheat, 100%. Wow. Wow. And even a lot of these people are gluten-free. They have, some of my patients have not eaten gluten in 10 years, and yet they have active antibodies to the various components of wheat. Does this have to do with uh, like the prolamins and kind of how that uh, ultimately signals the same kind of immune response? Because someone doesn't have to be celiac to have a gluten intolerance, right? Oh, that's right. You know, celiac is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. And I see a number of patients with active celiac disease who are gluten-free. And, and I've written about that in The Plant Paradox. 70% of people with biopsy-proven celiac disease, and the gold standard of celiac diagnosis is still a intestinal biopsy. Um, now, we have really good blood tests for it as well, but the gold standard is a biopsy. So you take people with celiac disease with an intestinal biopsy, put them on a gluten-free diet, follow them for a year and a half on a gluten-free diet, and 70% of them still have celiac disease by intestinal biopsy. Now, the point of the plant paradox was, well, it's the other things besides gluten that were the troublemakers. For instance, I wouldn't have guessed that 70% of people who are sensitive to wheat are also sensitive to corn, and a ton of them, 70% of them. And corn is one of the mainstays of a gluten-free diet. That's a good point. Oops. Yeah. So uh, I think that that's what I postulated I was going to find um, when I wrote The Plant Paradox. But to actually see it in, in, in black and white, that 100% of people with an autoimmune disease are sensitive to various components of wheat. So does this mean they're just having flare-ups in completely different capacities? Does you tend to see, uh, you know, if someone is dealing with some kind of autoimmune condition and they have a reaction to a, you know, a mycotoxin or something in, in a grain versus uh, a barley versus, do they, do they tend to manifest in different ways or is it just kind of like, hey, this is one general flare-up that happens? 
Well, I guess that's um, – I still am not clear why in one person their autoimmune, their leaky gut manifests as psoriasis, for example. We know, number one, that people with psoriasis have a very unique – identifiable microbiome that's specific for people with psoriasis. And it's a dysbiotic microbiome. So, but they all, every one of them have measurable leaky gut. And the cool thing is, I guess the amazing thing is that when people follow my program, like in Gut Check, 94% of people with a, uh, Autoimmune disease that's measurable by blood tests and symptoms, 94% of them resolve their autoimmune disease. Their Hashimoto's markers go away. Their uh, anti-nuclear antibody goes away. Their Sjogren's antibodies go away, blah, blah, blah. 94% of them within nine months to a year are completely in remission off of their meds. Wow. That's not bad. Not bad at all. And today's video is sponsored by Seed. If you're worried about your gut microbiome, you're trying to make some changes, but ultimately, if you're trying to add carbohydrates back into your diet after doing low carb for a long time, very important you take care of your microbiome. So that link down below saves you 25% off of Seed's daily symbiotic which has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. So a capsule inside of a capsule. Super interesting technology. Very, very cool to check out. So they also fund a lot of microbiome research. So they put their money where their mouth is. A lot of the proceeds go back into research because we're trying to understand what these little microbes in our gut do and how important they are. So anyhow, it makes a big difference, it made a big difference for me. I don't usually recommend probiotics because a lot of them are garbage, but this one's definitely worth a shot. So that link down below is in the top line of the description for seed. Now, what's interesting, and this is what I learned, um, about when people read The Plant Paradox, about 90% of them resolved their issue, whatever they picked up the book for. No, whether it was a gut issue, whether it was a heart disease issue, whether it was diabetes, about 90% kind of across the board resolved. And that included my patients. About 10% didn't. And you go, well, what is it about you guys that this didn't work? And so that's kind of the plant paradox 2.0. So tests came out for what are called food sensitivities. Now, food sensitivities are totally different than food allergies. They work on a totally different immune system. Food allergies work on IgE, and food sensitivities work on IgG. Uh, just to give you an example, if you were I caught uh, we would develop IgG antibodies against the virus. Uh, that means that virus got through all of our defenses and our innate immune system said, oh, a bad actor, I'm going to remember it. I'm going to make a copy so I know what it looks like. And there'll be a help wanted poster in every post <laughs> office about, you know, this is a bad guy. So that's an IgG antibody. So what we found was that I used to do food allergy testing on all my troublemaking patients. And we'd put 100 little needle pricks on their back, and if it got a little red mark, you were sensitive. Uh, never really correlated at all. Never saw any benefit. So when food sensitivity testing came out, to me, that was a really game, game changer. What does that mean? So if you have intestinal permeability, if you have leaks in the wall of your gut. And remember, the wall of your gut is the same surface area as a tennis court from wow. your mouth down to your rear end. There's a tennis court in all of us. And we've got a design flaw. It's only one cell thick. And everything that we eat, everything that lives in us is only one cell away from the rest of us. And lining our intestine 80% of all of our immune cells, all of our white blood cells, are lined up right next to the wall of the gut. Why? Because there's only one cell between mischief and, and us. And so that's the border. 
So if you have a break in the border, and that was worked out by Alessio Fasano, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist now at Harvard, proved how it happened, proved how you can measure it. It's not pseudoscience. So if you have leaky gut, now your immune system can actually see particles of undigested food that would never have been seen before because the food was broken down into sugars, amino acids, and fatty acids and absorbed. But let's just suppose we've got a gap. Now, let's just take one that's kind of fun. Let's suppose you like broccoli a lot and you have leaky gut and you eat a lot of broccoli. You could develop IgG antibodies to broccoli even because you're eating a lot of it. And imagine your immune system all of a sudden a literal piece of broccoli gets on the wrong side of the wall of your gut and your immune system says, what the heck? I have never seen a piece of broccoli before. That's foreign to me. That's a splinter. And I'm going to make an antibody to it because it's foreign. I've never seen it before. And if I ever see it again, I will attack it. So when we started actually looking at food sensitivities, all of a sudden this whole Pandora's box opened up and we started seeing, oh my gosh, for you, the culprit might be romaine lettuce. For somebody else, the culprit might be bananas and so on down the line. And so when we started in my mischievous patients doing food sensitivities, it was like the light bulbs went off. And the cool thing is, and where I'm going with all of this is, once we identify, okay, here's the troublemakers, here's who your immune system is interested in, let's take those out of your diet, let's take the offenders who are causing leaky gut in the first place, and I still am convinced that lectins, for instance, gluten is a lectin, uh, are the troublemakers for most people. Let's take all those out of your diet, then let's watch your markers for leaky gut and watch them go away. So within nine months to a year, most people who follow the program, their leaky gut is gone. What's really cool is the immune system gets retrained. So all those people who now no longer have leaky gut, all their antibodies to the various forms of wheat are gone. They've forgotten how much they hated gluten or wheat germaglutinin. They're no longer there. And they forget how much they hate broccoli, just to use that as an example. And that's what's really empowering. So the, the carrot on the stick that I hold out for my patients is, look, I'm a really nasty guy. I'm going to take away probably some of your favorite foods in exchange uh, for you being miserable with me taking away your foods, your autoimmune disease will resolve, you'll feel better, you'll get off your medications, and then, good news, we can actually measure when it's time to reintroduce these foods. So are you looking at, like, what are the measurable markers nowadays, or some of them? Are you looking at lipopolysaccharide levels? Are you like, how, how are you determining uh, leaky gut these days? Well, you know, it's interesting when Alessio Fasano uh, first described this years ago, um, when, and he was interested in gluten, uh, gluten, if it can get to the wall of your gut, uh, hits a receptor and it makes a compound called zonulin. Now, zonulin then attaches to a second receptor and it flips a switch that breaks what are called tight junctions that kind of hold this border together. Uh, the tight junctions are made, among other things, of actin. And most bodybuilders know actin and myosin of how well, our muscles contract. So it's the same molecule. So when he first described this, everybody, including me, said, hey, this is great. All we got to do is measure zonulin levels. And if zonulin's elevated, bingo. Uh, we know that you got leaky gut. Oops, uh, when we started doing that, 
only about 10% of people had elevated zonulin levels, people that we were convinced had leaky gut. So uh, companies said, well, wait a minute. Zonulin would be attached to a receptor, and it wouldn't most likely be in the bloodstream. So we should actually be looking for somebody who had leaky gut. Zonulin would leak through the wall of the gut, and it's a foreign substance, and we should look for antibodies to zonulin. We should look for IgG antibodies to zonulin, and that may tell us what's happening. And sure enough, when anti-zonulin antibodies were measured, bingo. Everybody who you would have guessed had leaky gut had anti-zonulin antibodies. The second thing, if actin is broken, if the tight junction is broken, then actin can slip through the wall of the gut and be viewed as a foreign particle. And so anti-actin IgG was measured and cool, anti-zonulin and anti-actin is our how I use the diagnosis of leaky gut from a simple blood test. You can even do it with a finger prick. It's that accurate. Dang. Eh. Now, it, does that explain why, you know, you hear a lot of times people end up with, I don't know, a foodborne illness or something like that. Their mucosal layer gets destroyed. And then after that, they start having onset of autoimmune symptoms or they start having these issues they never had before. Um, is that just because you've compromised that, that, gut barrier and now yeah. you're much more exposed? Or yeah, for instance, I mean, one of the things that was interesting about is that most, a lot of leaky gut is caused by viruses. Viruses are really good at causing leaky gut, break, breaking down the gut wall barrier. And if you think about it, about 25 to 30% of the symptoms of are actually GI, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, and vomiting. And I, in my practice, long patients simply have long-term leaky gut. And once we seal the leaky gut, their long goes away. So yeah, viruses can do this. The other thing that really got my attention early on was in athletes who had a sports injury and their well-meaning physicians prescribed them High dose NSAIDs, Aleve, Advil, um, Motrin, Mobic. Um, and all of a sudden, these people would pop out with an autoimmune disease. Uh, some of them devastate. And they're going, and these are, I mean, these are healthy teenagers and young adults uh, who all of a sudden develop this autoimmune disease after taking these. And as I described in the plant paradox, one of the best ways to destroy your mucosal barrier is to take an Advil or an Aleve. It's literally like swallowing a hand grenade. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, you're looking at that COX-2 inhibition completely. I mean, you're just completely just, it's, I mean, I'll, I'll tell my own like story really quick. Hey, back in uh, August, I ended up with uh, cryptosporidium. I got a, a parasite. Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, a month and a half later, I'm showing markers for RA. Yep. I'm an athlete, healthy person, eat a healthy diet, you know, <laughs> and it's just granted I've been able to bring those numbers back down because I know what to do, but it's, it's just case in point, right? What about for people that, uh, you know, you look at like endurance athletes that deplete their, their gut barrier as well, right? Like yeah. oftentimes you see endurance athletes touting, well, take glutamine to support, which, you know, right or wrong, at least their head's in the right place you see the same kind of thing, right? Like overtraining or you're just depleting and you're, it's the same kind of thing. Does the same thing happen with chronic stress as well? Yeah, stress is definitely a, a good way of causing leaky gut. And in a way, it's actually almost the same thing that happens to endurance athletes. Um, and, you, you know, you see these marathoners have bloody diarrhea as they approach the, the finish line. <laughs> well, what happens with this is you... You want all your blood flow to your muscles, obviously, during intense competition. So you actually take away the blood flow from the intestinal wall. And it literally gets ischemic. And the intestinal wall starts sloughing. So that's where this bloody diarrhea comes in these folks. Yes. And if people don't realize it's the exact opposite occurs, for instance, if you eat before any exercise or any athletic competition, most of your blood flow is diverted down into your gut, the last place where you want it to be. 
And when I was growing up, um, our mother wouldn't let us go swimming for an hour after we ate breakfast or lunch because we would get cramps and die. And <laughs> there was a bit of truth to that wives tale because most of your blood flow was diverted to your gut and you didn't have enough blood flow to your muscles and technically you could have cramped up and drowned <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we literally we had to set you know she set the alarm clock and say okay you know you're you're, you're in for an hour and then you can go no i mean it makes a lot of sense where have you uh have you changed your stance on any specific foods, any specific vegetables, or is a lot of it coming down to, hey, it's a little bit more bio-individual based upon like what's causing an issue with you? Well, one of the things that has surprised me is we started doing more specific testing for uh, the components of dairy and the components of egg, either egg white or egg yolk, is that a large number of my patients with autoimmune diseases, at least initially, react to almost all forms of dairy and egg white and egg yolk. And that surprised me, um, but it was there and staring me in the face. And so, and I talk about in gut check, look, if you've got an autoimmune disease, for now, uh, give up all forms of dairy and give up eggs. Uh, and that's something that's changed with me. Now, for most people, we can get it back to them. Fermented dairy, actually casein, which is one of the trouble-making proteins in dairy, is broken down with fermentation and makes it a more favorable form. So when we add dairy back into people, we add usually sheep and goat cheeses back or sheep and goat yogurts back. Um, so, But dairy was a surprise to me about how many people react to it. The other thing, I'll tell you actually a humorous story. Um, in my, my practice, our initial food recommendations, we didn't allow people to have almonds because a lot of my patients, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, almonds were a trigger for them. They noticed that their joints hurt when they ate almonds. And so almonds were banned from the original list. And when I, when my editors with The Plant Paradox said, look, you are a really mean, mean nasty guy. You've taken all these things away from people. They can't have peanuts. They can't have cashews. Come on, throw us a bone. And I said, well, look, the almonds in general, the peel has the lectins. So if you have blanched almonds or if you have Marcona almonds or if you have almond flour, it'll probably be okay. Say, oh, okay, okay. So fast forward when we began food sensitivity testing, lo and behold, almonds popped up, almond flour popped up as this trigger for a great number of my patients. And I went, son of a gun. You know, I, I knew I shouldn't have let people have almonds. Uh, so I, I have a list of the top 12 worst offenders that really surprise people. But almonds are, are number one on the, on the offender list. You know what's wild is, you know, for 10 years I did a ketogenic diet. Right? That's uh, a lot of my channel was built talking about that. And I started noticing that, you know, as more and more keto products came out, we were consuming more and more and more almond flour, right? And I started to notice to a point, I would start feeling foggy. I started recommending on my videos, maybe we should be reducing this almond flour. There's something going on, I can't put my finger on it, but why am I brain foggy every time I have almonds? I've since pretty much eliminated almonds out of my diet just because I, I don't think they're this terrible food, but I just don't feel good. I don't feel good and there's a clear line of how I feel between before eating almonds and after eating almonds. So, you know, it's the same kind of thing for me. <clears throat> Occasionally I'll have some sprouted almonds, but I really try to limit. It's just wild. And I almost wonder if all of these almond flour products coming on the market, like people are just consuming so much of them that either now they're noticing it and they didn't notice it before because maybe they weren't consuming as much or B, they're consuming it so much that they're developing issues with it. It's, it's kind of bizarre. Yeah, I have a, a woman patient that um, I've written about in the past who um, who had uh, psoriasis, really massive psoriasis, and we got her off of all of her meds and all of her psoriatic plaques resolved except one spot on her back, which is about two inches 
around. And she was really happy. She said, you know, hey, you know, I don't have it anywhere. It's not in my scalp. I'm, I'm a happy camper. But isn't it interesting that I have this one spot and it won't go away? And I said, well, would you mind if we do, you know, a food sensitivity test and see? And so it's a blood test and we sent it off. She usually gets the copy before I see her back in this case. And lo and behold, almonds was bright red that, you know, almond flour. And she was making almond flour cookies, almond flour bread you know, all the time. So she had about two weeks before our next appointment. So she stopped her almond. The other thing she was very sensitive was to vanilla bean. And mm -hmm. vanilla bean pops up all the time in people. So she took away her vanilla extract, which she was using in her almond flour cookies. And by I, so this was two weeks before I see her next. She walks in, she said, You're, you got to look at this. And you know, pulls up her shirt. It's now not two inches, but one inch in, in two weeks. And she says, it was, you know, the almond flour and the vanilla bean. And I've got an NHL star who was literally dying of Crohn's disease. And, I mean, 20 episodes of bloody diarrhea a day on multiple meds. Had to, got down to 87 pounds and was being cared for by his mother. And they found the Plant Paradox book and got down to about five bowel movements a day, started gaining weight. We did the same tests on him, and sure enough, almond flour and vanilla beans were one of his biggest triggers. Hmm. He's now back playing in the, in the NHL. Holy cow. Just getting rid. And it's like, what the heck? Almond yeah. flour and vanilla extract? And the hilarious thing is, so with those patients, I say, the great news is that imitation vanilla extract is just fine for you to use. It's, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying wow, that, right? <laughs> That's interesting. It's, and I've heard you kind of talk about this before, and it's actually it's made me scratch my head. This is an interesting story. I've always had a big sensitivity to poison oak, like always. Very sensitive to it ever since I was a young kid. About four or five years ago, I got a really bad systemic bout of it. Uh, really, really bad. It was in my airway. It was, it was really bad. I got one particular patch on my like my shin. It was really bad, really deep, really gnarly. Okay, that subsides. It was a miserable like six, eight weeks of not sleeping and whatever. Anyway, now this is funny. Whenever I have cashews, I can't eat cashews anymore. Whenever I have cashews, this is what's super bizarre. The rash comes back and I itch. No one believes me. People think I'm nuts until I literally, no pun intended, will eat cashews and it happens. And so my family's seen it because little things end up in there. Oh, here's a piece of chocolate. Oh, low carb chocolate. Didn't realize it was made with cashew butter. Should have looked. And then I'm like, oh, I'm itching. I'm itching. I'm like, holy cow. The rash is appearing like where I had poison oak. And it's, I mean, you can't make that. I guess you could make that stuff up, but that legitimately is happening to me. So I can't touch cashews. Yeah, it's, it's the it's same super, family as poison ivy. Yep. It's the it's the same family, yep. and yeah, it's amazing. I I was on shows. Uh, there was a there was a juice company. The young lady was listening, and we were talking, and she was a big fan of cashew milk, and she had really bad GI issues, and so she she gotten rid of dairy, and she was using cashew milk, and she overheard me saying, "Man, you know." cashew milk and cashews, if you like swallowing poison ivy, go right ahead. And so she stopped that. And I stopped by the studio for some other reason. And she grabbed me. She says, it was the cashews. It was the cashews. I, I don't have any issues anymore. You know, how did you know? I said, no, it's poison ivy. So yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's true when they harvest those things, they're wearing full gear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's cashew pickers disease. You, they get burns on their hands. Yeah. And the Amazonian Indians, where cashews originally came from, they always take the cashew nut off and eat the fruit. They, thro they throw it away. Wild. Eh. Eh. They, they give it to us. <laughs> well, so that, is there any, anything else you've you've sort of pivoted on uh, in the last five or six years before we wrap this up? Uh, one of the things that I come down really hard on is um, beef, lamb, and pork. 
and milk that isn't fermented. Um, and I wrote about this in The Plant Paradox. Uh, there is a sugar molecule in beef, lamb, and pork, and milk um, that is called New 5 capital GC. It lines the blood vessels of these animals. Uh, it lines it's in the mammary glands of these animals. Uh, we have a very similar molecule that's called Nu5 capital AC. Nu5 GC and Nu5 AC are identical except for one molecule of oxygen. They're otherwise the exact same molecule. They're a sugar molecule, sialic acid. Now, our gut wall has these sugar molecules. The protective layer of our blood vessels, which is called the glycocalyx, and there won't be a test, is lined with new 5 ac sugar molecules. The blood-brain barrier, the thing that protects our brain, also has a glycocalyx that's made of new 5 ac Our joint surfaces are made of new 5 ac Unfortunately, when we eat new 5 gc it's absorbed, and we make an antibody to it, an aggressive antibody to it as a foreign substance. Now, I wrote about this in The Plant Paradox, and we know that there's a strong association between red meat eating and coronary artery disease, dementia, arthritis, and cancer. Strong association. Association does not mean causation. I proposed, and other people proposed, that because these two molecules are so similar, that if we develop antibodies to new 5 gc and we do every time we eat it, then we mistakenly attack new 5 ac because it's so similar. It's molecular mimicry, and that's pretty good. Well, now in this book, the revelation is, here's the bad news. Not only do we make antibodies against new 5 gc but new 5 gc because it's so similar to new 5 ac can substitute for new 5 ac in the lining of our blood vessels in the lining that protects our brain and in our joints and so we attack the new 5 gc that's displaced new 5 ac and the bad news is the more new 5 gc we eat the more we displace new 5 ac now, the really scary part is that animals hate having new 5 gc in their brain, even if they make it, and they actively keep it out because new 5 gc is a major cause of neuroinflammation. So now you've got the wall protecting your brain, now made of new 5 gc You attack that, the blood-brain barrier gets broken, and now new 5 gc is in your brain, and you actively attack your brain. So it's no longer association. It is now causation. You want the good news? What's the good news? Now, first of all, I have no dog in this fight. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Nebraska is the beef state for a reason. I have no dog in this fight. If you ferment milk or if you ferment animal products, for instance, with a sausage, the bacteria or the yeast actually eat the new 5GC and it's gone. So it turns out that a lot of these long-lived people are actually fermented sheep and goat dairy eaters, and they also are sausage eaters. And the sausage makes it safe. And if you think about it way long time ago, you had no preservation system for meat, so you had to make it into something that was fermented. In fact, fun fact, Prosciutto is loaded with bacteria that are really good for you. And that's what makes prosciutto prosciutto. And it's eaten all the new 5GC. Interesting. And it's, yeah, it's got all those bioactive peptides. And yeah. you look at yeah. all the Mediterranean cultures that eat it. Yeah. And people in America a lot of times say, oh, that's processed meat. Yeah. No. The, <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, here it's processed yeah. meat. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the longest, longest longevity 
uh, life expectancy in the world is this little tiny country called Andorra between Spain and France in the Pyrenees Mountains. They have a life expectancy, both men and women, of 90 years. Yeah, pretty good. They're sheep herders, and they eat sausage every day. And you go, wait a minute, that's not good for you. And, well, they're the longest living people in the world. Interesting. Yeah. What's their carbohydrate intake, if any? Uh, they mainly subsist on uh, cheeses and meats. Uh, they do eat grains, but um, they're totally different than our grains because yeah. they don't have any glyphosate over there. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to ask you that because I, I've, you talk to people, they go to Europe, they're like, hey, I ate bread, I ate, I ate pasta, and I didn't have any issues. I didn't have GI issues. I didn't have brain fog. Like, Clearly, there's something different there. Like what? What's so? It's what is the? Is there any differences besides the glyphosate? Like, is there anything that? Uh, is there lower levels of gliadin? Is it like what is it? No, I, I think um, Dave Asprey might disagree with me. I think the genetic alterations of our wheat um, are, are are too easy because even in Europe. Uh, harvesting wheat that's a short stalk is much easier than harvesting wheat that's a tall stalk because it tends to break. And remind me to tell you a funny story about oats if we have the time. Um, so most of the wheat, even grown over in Italy or Ukraine, is now basically the same variety that we do. The difference is that we spray almost all of our grains with glyphosate as a desiccant uh, roundup roundup used to be used for gmo products but now it's much easier to harvest a field that's dry and water costs a huge amount of money to carry and so you're much more efficient if you kill the crop and dry it out and then harvest it and so factory farms now always spray all their crops with glyphosate to kill it so that they can harvest it on a schedule. So all of our stuff is loaded with glyphosate. And in Europe, it's almost non-existent. Uh, and each year, the bans in Europe get stronger and stronger against glyphosate. So you're right. I have a lot of my patients who their autoimmune disease is gone, their psoriasis is gone, or their Crohn's is gone, and they go over to Europe, and you're right. They go, oh, you know, that croissant looks really good, or wow, that pasta looks really good, and, and they have it. And they go, oh my gosh, this is great news. Dr. Gundry has cured me. <laughs> you know, I can have this stuff. And they come back, and they start eating our stuff. They eat the sourdough bread here, or they have our pizza. And within two weeks, they're on the phone going, what the heck? You know, my patch on my arm is back. Or what the heck? My joint hurts. I thought you cured me. I said, I didn't cure you of glyphosate. And it's the dumb glyphosate. <laughs> That's so wild. And I, I didn't forget. So tell us the, uh, tell me the oat story. All right. And I talk about this in the book. There's a banned uh, herbicide that is used, I kid you not, to make oak stalks uh, shorter because if it's a short stalk, uh, it doesn't break in the wind. And if it breaks in the wind, you're done. Uh, and so it's totally illegal in this country to use it to retard the growth of oats. But it's not illegal to use in other countries. And um, the EPA set a bare minimum standard that this agent shouldn't, you know, be on this. During the former administration's tenure, the EPA was told to loosen the rules for this herbicide. And now all of our oats, including all of our healthy oats like Cheerios and old-fashioned Quaker oats are loaded with this herbicide, which is banned as unfit for human consumption. Interesting. Just so we can have short stocks. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, interesting. Oh, well. Yep. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well. Dr. Gundry, where can everyone find your new book and where else can they find you? 
Well, wherever you want to order your books, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, um, it'll, it'll be there. I've had multiple New York Times bestsellers, so go to your local bookstore. You can be assured that they'll order it because my books luckily sell well. Uh, please help the, book, the local booksellers was a disaster for them and they need all the help they can get so you know, go visit your local bookseller agreed with you there well dr gundry thank you so much hey thanks for having me